Mount and Blade 2 Bannerlord is quite possibly one of my new all-time favorite games. The title is phenomenal, and from everything I can tell, a worthy successor to Mount and Blade Warband. However, for all that brilliance, intricacy, depth, and control, the game does a very lackluster job educating a player as to how or what to do in order to maximize their own enjoyment. And today, I want to cover 10 essential tips for any new player that I truly, truly wish I had known within my first few hours of gameplay. The format here is going to be slightly different. Normally I script the entire video, or at least most of it, but this time I just have bullet points and I'll be explaining in-game in real time, without a script, because I feel it better suits the task. These are tips that will come into use during the main campaign mode and probably be helpful after the first couple hours of gameplay, maybe an hour or so, when the complexity really opens up and the game has stopped explaining as much to the player. Without further ado, let's get started. Tip number one is the encyclopedia. If you press the N key on your keyboard, you will open up this, the encyclopedia. And this is probably the most valuable thing that the game never really explains to you or tells you about. Any veterans of the series will know about this, it's fairly simple. Um, but what you have here is a complete encyclopedia of everything in the game, and it's extremely comprehensive. You have the kingdoms, where you have all the different uh, factions, you have all the, the different clans in the factions, all the people in all the different clans, all the things that they own, all the locations which you can track and untrack, which will then put a marker on your map for that uh, location. Then you have all the settlements attached to them, and then there's a little descriptor of the settlement. You can see what they actually, uh, you know, what the settlement has for sale in that location. Um, there's so many different things in here, and the game never really tells you about it. Not to mention the fact that a lot of times there's going to be certain NPCs or characters that you need to find in the world. For example, this guy right here. So let's say I need to find him for one of the main quests. All I have to do if I'm struggling to do that and people keep telling me about him is go to his encyclopedia page, and there I can see where he was last seen. Click that, click track, and then I can go to that location. It makes it so much easier. It really does have everything you could possibly need in the encyclopedia, and the game doesn't do a very good job telling you about it or telling you how to use it. The tip essentially boils down to hit the N key, open the encyclopedia, and then type whatever you are having tr trouble understanding into the search bar. It could be as simple as typing infantry so that you can find all the different infantry units and then learn more about them. It could be something like a location. If you're really struggling to find it on the map, just type, start typing the name and you'll be able to find it. Um, this search bar is your best absolute best friend and it will make the game so much better the earlier you start utilizing it. Tip number two is kind of broad, but it mostly revolves around looters, which are these guys right here with a brown and black little banner. They're very basic units. You'll get familiar with them even after just a couple of minutes of gameplay. You'll find them right off the bat. So the point here is that there are a couple of different reasons why you want to keep track of them, especially in the early game. Number one is that for certain quests, you're going to need to be getting to a higher clan tier rank. And then especially on top of that, if you go to your clan page, um, getting to clan tier two is very, very important for opening up a broader aspect to the game. Um, but getting to clan tier two can take a little bit of time. You need a certain amount of renown to do that. Uh, and there's a lot of options that only open after that point when you are at clan tier two. So the fastest way that I've found to get to clan tier two and unlock all of those things is to hunt down specifically only looters and make sure that you're killing them as often as possible. Um, now I'm a lot stronger than this group because I've been playing for a lot longer. Um, and this, you typically be doing this uh, early on in your playthrough. But basically all you're gonna be doing is finding the looters who are extremely weak, surrender or die, and then you're just gonna auto resolve the combat. This is the fastest way that I've found. Maybe there's faster ways, but this is pretty high up there. Um, this is one of the fastest ways to get through and, and level up your clan quickly, uh, just spamming these looter encounters um, so that you can get to clan tier two and unlock, you know, joining a faction, which opens up a, a broad spectrum of gameplay. Um, yeah, so that's the fastest way to do that. However, there is another use for them as well. And that comes when you actually do have a stronger army. So as you can see, I'm about 85. And if I go into my party, uh, this is my second playthrough right now. I had another one where some stuff went wrong, but whatever, that's a different story. Um, my, my stuff is pretty highly leveled. It, it's fairly well leveled up. And if I continue to level it all, all up, I, I can show you here. Um, I, if I wanna train things, looters seem to be the best way to do that because for some reason or another, after a certain threshold, let's say probably around 40 to 50 army strength when you've upgraded them to tier two or tier three units in that range, looters never ever actually kill your troops. They will injure your troops and I've never once seen them kill one of my troops over the past, I don't know, probably like 12 hours of gameplay. 
unless I have a full army of specifically recruits. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not getting a ton of experience, though. So if you auto-resolve a whole bunch of looter conflicts, even though they seem tremendously weak compared to you, uh, it will still be worth it. You will train your units. You never, ever lose anything. It's the easiest way to farm quickly and up your army strength. Now, there are other bandit types that are more lucrative in the sense that you'll get a lot better gear, uh, you might get more gear, or you can capture better troops. But looters, by and large, despite being the weakest, have the most utility and are the easiest to farm safely and have, you know, a lot of benefits to doing so. Tip number three has to do with unit speed and pathing, which is either very convenient or very inconvenient depending on how you approach it. And it's also super convenient early on in the game when you're trying to track down all those looters to level up your clan. Um, so the thing is that, that every single unit has its own speed. So if I approach this caravan here, you can see that their speed is 6.3 and my speed is 5.8. Technically speaking, I should never be able to catch them. They are faster than me. Um, but the thing about the enemy AI is that it always runs directly away from you. So what you can do, instead of just double clicking and having time go very quickly, you see how if you double click, time speeds up to, to fast forward three. Instead of doing that, you can go one click at a time very slowly and try and pin a faster unit in a corner. And then all that's gonna happen is it's gonna go back and forth trying to get away from you. And if you just keep cycling back and forth, you can gain distance on it without it getting away. And slowly over time, you'll get to the point where you can actually attack it. So this is a way to take down caravans that are much faster than you and that you otherwise would never be able to touch and get a lot of money very quickly. Um, and it's actually very, very effective. So if you ever have an enemy that's faster than you that you really want to take down, it's kind of easy to find one of these things, uh, one of these places, uh, a peninsula or some place where a river is or anywhere where there's a little bit of a, of a pushback where they can't cross something or go over some mountains. And all you have to do is trap them and then and swivel back and forth uh, until you get close enough to attack them. The second portion of this tip is that horses uh, in your inventory will speed up your travel. So it seems to me, and I could be wrong about this, this is actually slightly speculation here, it seems to me that travel speed is a function of carry capacity, mostly, and then troop size versus horse count. So having a ton of horses, I don't know if there's a specific threshold, but having a ton of horses in your inventory will tangibly increase your movement speed and make it easier to run down bandits or, or track down enemy armies or things like that. So having a bunch of horses in your inventory and then when you are slower than something else, being able to trick the AI into going doubling back onto you and then you can attack them anyways, uh, that is extremely useful. Tip number four is influence. Now influence is a kind of currency that you're gonna unlock after joining a major faction, which you can do again after clan tier two, which opens up a whole different aspect to the game. But influence is basically a currency that you're gonna need a lot of. And I've found that the fastest way to farm this once you are starting to utilize it heavily is to go to any allied city that you do not personally control. Let's say Rote, for example. Go to the keep, go to the dungeon, and donate prisoners. All you're gonna be doing is donating every prisoner that you've gotten here. Um, it's Sometimes you can be ransoming these for profit as well, which is also kind of good. Um, but for in, just for demonstrational purposes here, if you're trying to farm influence, you're gonna be donating all your prisoners. And as you can see, I'm at 349 with, this is after one caravan fight from the, uh, the tip that I just did. Um, and if I donate here, I went from 349 to 392. This is by far, as far as I can tell, the fastest way to gain influence, which allows you to do a whole bunch of different things and unlocks a different aspect to the game. So whenever you need influence, just donate a ton of prisoners that you've captured from other factions or a ton of bandit prisoners. Doesn't really matter to any keep or any town that you do not actually control yourself. Tip number five is passive income, and this should honestly be your top priority early on in the game until it's been taken care of and you have at least a couple hundred gain per day, if not a few thousand. Um, it's very easy to do. All you need is about 15,000 to get started and go to any you know friendly allied town or, or major hub and then enter. Once you're inside, and as soon as it loads in, I'll demonstrate, it's pretty simple. Again, have about 15,000 gold and you should be able to do it without an issue. Hold the Alt key right here and you'll see a bunch of names pop up and you can see a linen weavery or a tannery or an olive press. Those are called workshops. And if you go to any one of these with over 15,000 gold, perhaps it's like 16,000 or 14,000, a little more or less, you can buy them and they will give you passive income. And they'll start to give you maybe three, 400 gold per day as opposed to losing that gold. Um, so this is just one example. I already have the maximum number, so I can't actually buy it and show you, but inside uh, these workshops, there will be uh, NPCs that you can talk to and then you can purchase it. The other thing is that some of these NPCs around here, let's say, um, 
I'm not sure which one would have it, but if you talk to some of these named NPCs that are around the market, some of them will have the opportunity to set up a caravan. And all you need to do, again, is have a similar amount of coin. If you talk to them, and let's see if this guy has it, and that would be a, a good example. Um, there we go. I wish to form a caravan in this town. All you need is a free companion, and I'll talk about how to get companions in just a second right after this. All you need is a free companion, 15,000 gold, and you can set up a caravan, which will earn you quite a bit of money and travel to and from that city. Um, that's just yet another way to, to earn passive income, and if you combine that with the workshops, you'll have enough that will uh, basically keep you topped up and make it so you're gaining money every day instead of losing it. And then, for those that are wondering where to find companions, though that's a, a pretty easy one, um, you go to the tavern right there. Um, enter any major city, you can go directly to the tavern, you don't have to walk there. Uh, go to the tavern, just talk to anybody there, any named NPC there can probably be recruited into your party for about, you know, five or six or seven or eight, even sometimes a couple thousand, but typically for about five to six hundred gold. Tip number six is vendor scouting, which is probably going to be one of the easiest methods to earn that initial 15,000 that you're going to need to establish passive income. And as you can see there, there's caravans, there's, you know, taxes from certain regions, there's all sorts of things, uh, smithy, tannery, wine press, etc. Um, to do this, you know, scouting vendors, all you need to do is check in with the trade option at every single place that you go to. And all you need to do is click on miscellaneous. Um, you can do it with, with other things, but miscellaneous to look at all the goods and then check mouse over them and you'll see a red or a green or a yellow icon for the price. This, this unit right here, grain is more expensive. Red is more expensive, more expensive. All of these are much more expensive right now, except for, for linen here. Um, however, if there was a green one, and this is a really bad example because there's, there's nothing worthwhile to trade there. Um, let's go to Sargot and see if there's anything there. You're looking for green icons. Uh, to buy. You always want to be buying from green icon, uh, you know, various different raw materials and then selling those raw materials somewhere else. Let's see if this has anything better. Um, if we go to miscellaneous, there is, yeah, here we go, flax. So this item is 33% cheaper than average. Now I typically wait until it's about 50% cheaper than average. I only look for green, um, you know, cheap units that are 50% underpriced. Um, that gives me a lot more profit and I can buy in, in a larger bulk if there's a large supply like this. However, um, raw materials with green prices are going to be profitable to on to onboard into your inventory, so you can buy a bunch of them. Uh, it goes up 26% cheaper. And then, once you have all the flax, you mouse over it, and you can see the rumors of where it will trade best. So if I go all the way to lug, I, I don't know how to pronounce that, but if I go to these other places, I can sell it for a substantial increase over what I just paid. So if I go here, and then this feeds back into the encyclopedia, press the N key, because I don't know off the top of my head where that is. Um, and then I go here and I can track. Once I've tracked that, good to go. It is right over here. So all I need to do is leave, go there, and then sell the goods that I just got. Now the, price, the prices can change in transit, um, which is kind of annoying when you get there and it's a completely different price. Uh, but for the most part, if it's anywhere in the near vicinity, you can get there without the price changing too much and you can offload all of the cheap goods that you just got for a much higher price and get to that 15,000 uh, bare minimum or 30,045 increments of 15,000 to establish passive income in major cities. Tip number seven is about smithing, which originally during my first like 16 hours of gameplay, I had no idea about and I really, really wish that I had. So smithing is a complicated thing, but the, the primary use is going to be to forge different weapons, etc. But there's another secondary use that I didn't even think of that is on, honestly more important for the first like 12 hours of your campaign session, um, which I want to talk about now. So the thing that you want to look at is let's say you have... Um, an iron uh, scimitar, scimitar. I, don't, I honestly don't know how to pronounce that, or any one of these things here. They cost about 100 gold, or they would sell for about 100 gold. If I sell one of these, um, I get 134 gold uh, done. Now, if I go into the trade section, uh, and I go to the materials, and I go to hardwood, I can get a bunch of the hardwood for 15 each because they're, they're underpriced here, but even if they were overpriced, this would still work by a huge margin. So you get a bunch of hardwood, you take the hardwood, you go to the smithy, you turn the hardwood into charcoal and you refine it. Um, and then once you've refined a bunch of charcoal, you go to smelt and you take all of these different things that you were going to sell for about, let's say, 100 to 130 gold and you, uh, you smelt them down into materials. So this, this sword right here, this iron sword, which I was selling for, I believe, 130 something, 134. If I smelt that down, it gives me five wrought iron and two regular iron. And then if I go back into the trade section uh, and I were to sell these materials, where are they? Wrought iron 
and iron. So five wrought iron and two regular iron. You can see that the, the amount of money that I'm getting is completely disproportionate to what I would have gotten if I sold the actual uh, you know, piece of gear. So you always, always, always wanna be smelting down all of the stuff that you get because not only will you get smithing experience and be able to smith things later on with that skill set if you wanna be using that mechanic in the game, but you'll also be drastically increasing the amount of money that you get each and every single time. On top of this, and something that I forgot to put in on the first edit of this video, when you're in the smithy, if you have a party member who is very, very good at smithing already and has that skill set, you can select them. So you do not have to smith as yourself. If you have a high skilled smithing companion, you can actually use them as a mule to do all of this. The game has incredible depth. Tip number eight revolves around individual autonomous parties. So once you level up your clan to tier one or two, and once you have party members, especially you go into your clan page, you go to the parties tab and you can create parties with your different party members, your uh, different clan members as the leader. Now I can't do it right now because I have a bunch of caravans going, I have another party, all of my guys are busy at the moment. However, once you create a party, you can populate that party with its own army. So this guy right now is running around with his own squad of people. He's earning me reputation. And the great thing about this is that you don't lose reputation from these guys, at least not any time that I've seen. They only gain you reputation with certain NPCs that they interact with. So having a couple of parties going around one to two at least as early as you can is going to be great. Uh, you want to deck out all the gear that they have as well, make sure that they're, you know, combat ready, etc. Um, but once you've created a new party, selected your whatever party member or um, clan member you have as the leader and then populated it, they will run around and earn you money. Not only will they earn you money, they'll earn you reputation and they'll be doing this autonomously and you can forget about them. So it's a really good thing to do as early as possible. Tip number nine comes when you join an actual large faction and you start to play the politics of the game. If you go to your kingdom panel, what you'll see is that there are a bunch of different options. You have diplomacy, armies, policies, clans, uh, fiefs, but policies is what you're going to care about. So once you're in an actual large faction, you have to play politics. It's going to come down to how much people like you. Um, and there's ways to check that. You can go to your encyclopedia and check who your enemies and friends are. Um, but the main point is that you want to be generating positive reputation with a lot of these people. And one of the easiest and fastest ways to do this, though it is kind of a one-off, you can't do it multiple times necessarily. But one of the easiest ways to do this is to search through all the different options for laws. And if you find any that are universally praised, especially ones that are up towards 100% favorability, all you need to do is select one of them, and I can demonstrate with one that's not because I've already done this myself. Um, but let's see, especially if you agree with the law or it's a bonus that you actually want, so you need to be taking a close look at these. Um, but just for demonstrational purposes, let's say, um, let's do State Monopolies. I don't want him to have that, uh, the leader. I don't actually like the leader of my clan, but that's beside the point. State Monopolies. This has a 66% approval rating, so an easy way to get reputation um, with the majority of the clan is to support, is to propose that for 50 influence and then support that for 20 influence. Now, once I do this, you're gonna see that my reputation is increasing even with people that dislike me. So from by five to 24, by five to 24, um, by five to 28. So I'm gaining reputation with the majority of my clan who are then gonna support me in other decisions. Um, and it, it's easy, uh, as far as I can tell, it's the easiest way to gain um, faction clan uh, reputation with the surrounding lords that are a part of your your social structure here. Uh, it is mostly a one-off though. Um, you can't do this multiple times with the 100% and sometimes you can reject proposals. If everybody's against it up here, you can overturn them. So there's a kind of a back and forth that happens. Um, but that's a good thing to keep in mind. Policies are an important part of the end game here. The last tip that I have revolves around your character sheet and leveling up, which is something that I didn't fully understand for an embarrassingly long period of time when I first started. Um, basically, there's a, a multi-phase component to this. Number one, these skills right here, all of these different things, crossbow, bow, riding, etc., athletics, they will all increase as you're doing them. So as you're using your bow, it will go up. As you're riding, it will go up. Um, so that's the first aspect. And then the, the hidden kind of, you know, subsurface aspect is that you will improve at these activities uh, the more that they level. So right now I'm getting much better at using a bow and it really shows in combat. It absolutely shows. Athletics will have various different passive increases that you might not notice on any sort of stat sheet, but uh, it's gonna control you know how your character moves, uh, speed, etc. So there are passive bonuses to these things. The second aspect is that you have focus points. Now, focus points increase the learning rate by a multiple. So stacking up a bunch of focus points in something that you're gonna use a lot of is gonna be really helpful. So I'm going for bow and riding because I like to be a horse archer on this playthrough. 
Um, there are other things that you can do. I stacked up trade, even though I haven't been using all that much. Um, so stacking up your focus points in the things that you want to prioritize is the way to increase the learning rate. And then there is also all the individual uh, perk choices in there, which will be you know highlighted as soon as you unlock them. And then on top of that, you have free attribute points, which are placed into these categories. So every three levels, you'll get a free attribute point, and you can place that into the category where there's multiple things that you want to be training. So I put a few into social to increase trade, but then also, you know, as a side effect, increase leadership or charm, which has different dialogue options, um, helps me in certain circumstances, uh, and has various bonuses like leadership, the, the one perk that I wanted so I could train that faster is raise the meek. Now these... Uh, it helps with, uh, you know, increasing troops and giving medium XP bonuses per day. Now, the thing about these is that you don't need them to win the game. There's no builds, there's no like hyper meta builds that are more effective than everything else. Um, but whatever you're doing, if you're doing it a lot, you can increase the efficiency and have some pretty sizable bonuses. So always remember to allocate free attribute points, remember to allocate uh, allocate focus points, and then also choose the individual perks as you unlock different things uh, in those categories. Uh, it's something I didn't know a lot about. I was confused by this system at first, um, but it really is just a three-prong system. Focus, attribute points, um, perks, and then you get passive bonuses from these categories as well as active perk bonuses. The last tip that I have, which is more of an honorable mention than an actual tip, um, since I've already done them, is that you know learning all of your different command options in battle is going to be super, super effective. The one that I want to highlight as the honorable mention is selecting different units, like these guys, my cavalry, and then hitting F6 on the keyboard. F6 will allow the AI squad commander to take control of them. So what I normally like to do is select at least one unit, one larger unit of maybe cavalry or something like that, and give the AI control while I then select everything else with uh, a different key and then do charge. So you can give different, uh, it's really, it sounds like a stupid tip, um, but you need to get familiar with the, uh, the combat controls. But the, the number one that I would say to get familiar with as a new player is selecting um, a certain set of units, right? Let's say it's cavalry or something and then F6 to release control of that unit from yourself over to uh, an AI squad commander. And that can be extremely helpful in large scale battles. That's all the tips for today that I have. Uh, hopefully those were helpful and I will be trying to come back with, with more stuff. I'll do a combat guide, I hope. Um, I might do an economy guide, uh, anything else that, that seems like the right thing to do. Uh, there, there's a, a wealth of possible videos and educational material to do on this game, but I need to become a much you know more informed uh, authority on the game first, which requires a lot more playtime because it is a very complicated game with a lot of strategy. Um, and these were just tips that I had, I really wish I had known early on in my gameplay session and that I uncovered and learned after about, let's say 24 to 26 hours of gameplay. But that's it. Thank you all for watching. As always, links down below to support, you know, Twitter, merch, Patreon, all sorts of stuff like that, but I'll cut it there and stop rambling. Thank you all for watching yet again and have a nice night.